as Raj was speaking, I, I personally was really reminded of what uh, we found at Times Tech Keys five years ago and uh, went through precisely those kinds of challenges that he talked about. And more interestingly, you know, uh, the reason we founded Times Tech Keys was, of course, um, technology was really happening in India. You could see it in Bangalore. It was buzzing, the kind of campuses that were coming up, phenomenal, and the amount of hiring that was happening. And we, we felt we are Times of India. We are not a business daily. We need to, we can't be only focusing on the CEOs and the CXOs. They anyway get a lot of publicity. Uh, we need to also focus on the engineers and the technologists who are actually delivering these fantastic products and services out of India. And as Raj said, bring smiles to, I mean, all of you. And that is really what has helped Times Tech Techies grow. We started with just a single page in the Times of India on a Wednesday and only in Bangalore and Hyderabad. Since then, we grew to the eight biggest cities of Times of India and thereafter to two pages a week. It's seen as the most successful product that Times of India has brought out in many years. And honestly, it's because of the kind of work that all of you are doing and which we are able to showcase to the rest of India. So it's really nice to be here amongst such talent. And, and we've been focusing precisely on this, on helping all of you in your careers, showcasing your talent, showcasing the work that you're doing. And for that reason, this particular topic of jobs is something that's very close to my heart. So very glad that um, Raj and all of you decided on this. When we started Times Tech is five years ago, and for several years after that, of course, we were, were writing on a variety of topics. What I find very interesting is that, uh, of course, cloud kind of dominated a bit of those conversations. But in the last one year, literally, it's almost literally, I mean, the only thing that we seem to be writing on is AI. Uh, if you look at a Times Techies page, most stories tend to be on AI today. Uh, and I think something really big is happening. Every company today wants to talk about only AI in some sense. Uh, so very, very relevant topic. Let, Chris, let me start with you. Uh, <coughs> in the US today, uh, of course, technology is really happening. All the big technology companies are doing really well. Uh, but there are also some concerns around jobs. Uh, we hear about layoffs and things like that. From a U.S. and a global perspective, give us an idea. How do you think tech jobs will pan out over the near future? So, uh, from my perspective, I do think the current demand and actually the, the increasing demand for not only digital transformation, but what I'm calling sort of intelligence transformation jobs will continue. And not just continue, but grow. And, and fundamentally, the platforms, the tools, the processes of how we actually accomplish these and sort of how we put them together to actually provide value for our, our customers, or as we, Raj was talking about earlier, I do think the demand for that is going to go up. Technology always has a bunch of spikes and sort of, but the, the, flat, the flat growth is sort of going to be increasing over the longer term. And, um any particular kind of job you're saying AI kind of jobs so, will be the ones. Uh, well, so but AI isn't just a it isn't just a, an AI job. There are so many different jobs and and roles that go into actually a successful AI project. Why do we hear about layoffs in by these big tech companies? They seem to be making tons of money, well, but uh, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think what you're trying to do is you are trying to put um, the right pieces in place, and as the landscape changes so quickly you may not have the right tools for the job. So you're trying to sort of constantly switch. So I think you might see reskilling and sort of those sorts of things. But I think that's where the pressure is coming from. Like, you know, you, if you made a cake in the 60s and you made a cake today, your oven's a lot better, your mixer's a lot better, how you're reading the instructions is probably on a phone or a tablet. So it's very, very different. Okay. But you think tech jobs are still going to grow? I over. still think tech jobs. I mean, I still think tech jobs are going to be growing in demand. Okay, yes. Sangeeta, similar question. I mean, India, of course, for the last many years, 
Indian IT, Indian technology has been one of the biggest stories for India. It's grown humongously. It's a reason for Times Techies' success. Uh, you know, I suspect it's a very significant part of GDP today. Our exports, I keep hearing that it is services which is driving our exports and our economy in general. And my guess is a very, very major part of services is IT and tech. So you've done a phenomenal job. Right now, where do you think we are? I mean, we do hear about of a slowdown in tech jobs. IT services definitely is down. My colleagues just today wrote about, I mean, yesterday, which appeared in today's paper, about the three big IT services companies, their headcount having dropped by nearly 64,000 and all that. And overall, Indian technology, because of GCCs and all that, is still growing. What do you think is the future of jobs, especially of AI jobs? I hope this is working. So first, I want to start by congratulating Raj and each one of you for the 10th anniversary celebration. Um, I think for a company that was born in the digital inflection point, this is AI will be your next inflection point, And I'm really looking forward, Raj, to the next two decades of, of growth and success for all of you here today. Uh, and I think just like you're celebrating Brilio's success, I think you should also celebrate how important India's tech sector has been for our country, right? Um, I think Sud uh, Sujit mentioned that how it's a contributor to GDP. So today it's a $250 billion sector. That's almost about 7% of India's GDP. It's the largest contributor to India's services exports, about 51% to India's service exports. It directly employs about uh, 5.45 million people. And I think just about everything development that you see across India, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's education, I think our sector has propelled a lot of that. So each of you, while, while I think you're very proud of your organization, you should also be very proud of what the sector is doing to transform India. I'll come back to the difficult part of Sujit's question on saying, so what's happening right now? Um, I think one, there is still job creation happening in this industry. Uh, the media tends to be a lot more influenced with what is happening only in the big services companies. And yes, uh, there is some sort of a correction happening there because of the overhiring that happened in 21 and 22, and it's not just India, right? You see this in big tech companies that is happening. So one is that we hired as an industry almost 800,000 people in 21, 22, and that's never happened, right? So there is a correction that 800, happened. 800,000. 800,000, wow. right? So there's a correction that's happening in 23, 24. But even the data that NASCOM published as of uh, March 24, we are seeing the industry created almost 60, 70,000 net new jobs. So despite some companies degrowing, there is lots of opportunity out there. Um, also, the slowdown in hiring, uh, and I'm using the word slowdown and not layoffs, is because of the global macro environment. I don't think AI has a role to play there. AI is an opportunity for our industry, and I think that's how we should think about it. It will create new jobs, yet the jobs will be different, but there's no reason to say it'll take away my job. And I think that's the real message that I want to leave with each of you, that don't fear AI. It's an opportunity for India, just like we wrote the digital, the cloud, every technology wave. I think we can do very well with the AI wave also. Don't fear AI. It's an absolutely. Don't fear AI. It, it's an opportunity for India. Raj, do you feel you kind of touched upon it when you were speaking earlier? Uh, you said you are similarly optimistic about AI. You are a tech-first organization. Give us an idea. Your what, your sense of AI is it going to be good, bad, what? My belief is, and I think I, I very much buy into what uh, Sangeeta just said. Right. Um, so AI, I think, is going to make our jobs are lives better, right, um, definitely. How we serve our customers, you know, how you make better ice cream at home, you know, how you personalize things, right, and so on and so forth. And when I look at, you know, different types of jobs, so if you're in customer service, this, that, yes, you know, you can actually have an AI bot that actually can do some parts of that. So of course, there's automation that's gonna take place. But we will, I think, need, so this whole idea that some jobs will be impacted, I think is real, in my opinion, right? And I also buy that idea that Sangeeta was just saying that what we see today, companies laying off, I don't think is because of AI. 
Uh, it's too early to sort of, you know, even talk about that. You know, Tesla went from X number of employees in 2019, you know, to triple of that, you know, now. Now, when the sales plunge, because the economy can't handle, you know, that kind of growth, it is bound to actually lay some people off, right? And same is the phenomena, I think, across the sectors that you see. We had rapid growth, so I think that part. But going back to, you know, this whole idea of AI, I personally believe that, uh, one, it's a massive opportunity, you know, for tech companies, and I think it's even a bigger opportunity for India, right? Because, uh, look, engineering is going to be required. The future is going to be engineering, in my opinion. And India, I think, has the scale, has the talent, and has the investment of for the last 30 years, right, now into this field, to now take advantage of it. So I personally believe that it is going to require fine-tuning, though, right? Meaning you can't sort of say, well, I'm not going to change, I'm not going to retool, reskill, right, myself. I think, you know, I had an all-hands meeting just a few days ago, and my message to all of our employees has been that, look, the opportunity is big, but you have to reskill, retool yourself, right? And so, therefore, we are offering it to every single employee in the company, right? And I think and the same message I feel that, you know, so we will have a co-pilot, we will have a co-worker, you know, coding will become easier, engineering will become easier, right, et cetera. But the human ingenuity and, you know, and innovation doesn't go away, right? You know, the way we add value doesn't go away. And, you know, also remember that AI doesn't evolve if we don't evolve. So I think that's how I will say that I see a massive opportunity. Massive opportunity. So engineering is the future and lots of opportunity, but you need to reskill. Chris, along similar lines, um, you know, something that, and yes, uh, it's uh, said all the time by a lot of people, uh, professionals who do not use AI as part of their work run the risk of getting replaced by those using AI. Do you think that's a legitimate? Um, I do not think it's that simple. <laughs> um, but what I do think is that um, people in the workforce who are not open and sort of are sort of learning and willing to learn what this new tool is, what it can do, and how it can actually help their business, I do think they will struggle. Um, I think the challenge there is that some people are worried about, as we've talked about, some of the risks and limitations of AI, specifically in healthcare. Um, as we were talking about earlier, you can't be wrong, right? So there's a fear there, there's an anxiety there. So, but I think the way to move forward for people who may feel anxious and not willing and open to sort of um, embrace AI and technology specifically is they've got to be, we've got to know what the limitations are, what the risks are, and actually come up with ways to mitigate them. As we talked about earlier, there's, there are lots of tools in healthcare that nobody really knows what's behind them. Nobody knows the algorithm behind a blood count tool, right? What's your white blood count, your red blood, red blood cell count? How the math is done is not known. But everyone knows via research that it is a consistently reproducible test. Everybody uses it and there's a doctor in the room to actually make sure that they know how to interpret the results. I do see the same sort of paradigm playing out with artificial intelligence. Okay. Sangeeta, I wanted to ask you, I mean, as Chris and Rajan all said, I mean, you have to be agile, you have to change, you have to reskill. What is your sense of Indian tech talent? Um, over the years, have you seen them being agile enough and adjusting to the new realities and tech companies in general? I remember, for instance, um, you know, some years ago when cloud was becoming big and SaaS solutions were becoming big. Uh, we, people like Vivek Vadhwa literally wrote off the Indian IT services sector saying, oh, they're going to die now because of SaaS and all that. Didn't happen. I mean, they actually went from strength to strength and uh, uh, just shows how agile the tech industry has been. Today with AI, what do you sense? Do you sense it's going to be similar or is there a different picture emerging? So uh, I'm going to be honest and say I don't know, right? Um, I think the, if we go by the past, we've done it very, very successfully. And I think if the past is any indication, Sujit, we'll do it. But, but I want to build on Raj's point that this is not something you can take for granted. 
you have to invest in upskilling, you have to invest in being you know, innovative, you have to invest in building out the use cases, you'll have to look at new business models. You can't stay and say the past will determine my future. So, uh, so I think the message is really that yes, Indian IT and our tech talent can do it. I was just reading the recent Stanford AI index. It rates India the highest on AI skills penetration. Um, so if you just track uh, the relative penetration of AI skills across all LinkedIn profiles, India is at number one. So, so yes, I think, uh, and you know, everything that you track, GitHub, we are the second largest there. If you talk to Coursera, they are saying Indians are taking the largest number of courses on AI. So. There's a significant effort already underway on upskilling, retooling yourself for organizations to make that proactive investment in making it happen. So I would say, yes, we will be able to do it, but we cannot just say we've done it in the past and we'll be able to make it happen. I think we have to put that extra effort in saying, I will make it happen, I have to change to make it happen. Your message to all these youngsters and others who are building solutions right now? What what? Reskill, take these courses? Up. I think they're far smarter than me, so they know what to do. <laughs> Raj, uh, I mean, what, what kind of changes would you suggest to these professionals here? I mean, um, they, they, I, I mean, I've heard this being said, you need more understanding of the business. It's not just the technology side that you need to focus on, but you also need to understand the, the business side of it. Right. Uh, is that important? So I think... Um, <clears throat> My personal belief has always been that, and I think and I said it in my monologue as well, right, that you can't be about technology, right? You know, because technology for the sake of technology, I don't think is helping business. So therefore, um, um, that I think is required irrespective. But to think that you should focus more on learning business and domain because technology is now going to be done by AI, I don't think is right. I feel that the opportunity continues to be vast, right, you know, in technology itself. But for you to really have the impact of technology on the businesses, you have to understand the business anyway, right? So companies, individuals, you know, people who are not going to be able to transcend that, that, that gap the technology has with the business, I think we'll have a difficulty. I just returned from, and I'll take a brief moment, I just returned from uh, Google's conference in Vegas, and, um, and it was quite... Uh, interesting that uh, the Google leadership was saying, well, the product guys actually have built the AI technology, but the sales team doesn't know how to sell that to our customers, right? So now you can imagine if Google is struggling with that, then that's a struggle with every company, right? So, um, so yes, I think that's a massive opportunity in my opinion, so, you know, I think okay. that's... Well, what about, the uh, other day I was speaking to a recruiter who said it's no longer enough to just we know, for instance, just know Java. Now, you also need to know other skills which can help you do kind of an end-to-end -end process. Do you have a take so on I that? Think, look, I, I mean, I don't know what is end-to-end -end process, but it's like if I'm a Java programmer today, right, and um, if I want to do better tomorrow, then the first of, you know, at least I would recommend that if my job can be done 40% by AI or by any other coworker, co-pilot tool, I should adopt that, right? Don't fight it, adopt it, right? And see, with the help of AI, how can I do my job better? That's the first ask I would say. So now, if my productivity is X today, it can you know, be 2X tomorrow. It's not like we are not hiring, it's not like the tech world actually is just is dried of jobs and stuff like that. The second part, I think, is that you know, can you really combine now your skills, you know, and, you know, and you know, to your point about end-to-end, -end, I think the AI has the power to simplify some of the complexity that exists in the, you know, in the IT systems today, right? I think we all can start looking at how to leverage that to simplify a few things, right? That's how I would say it. Um, I personally don't think that, uh, you know, the, the jobs are going away or, you know, or I should just focus on something else, right? I think it's, uh, it's the time. I think I personally feel it's the time, and the time is now for everyone to actually jump on this and, and get ready for this. Okay. Chris, uh, just the last few weeks, we had the GE Healthcare CTO, Taha Kasut, I don't know if you know him, uh, 
the Siemens Heldinia CTO, both of them in town and talking about uh, the phenomenal changes that AI could potentially bring in healthcare. W what is your sense? Uh, is AI likely to bring some really transformative changes in healthcare? And in terms of AI jobs, what would that mean for jobs in healthcare? I seem to be getting all the hard questions, but what I would say is um, I would agree. I do think the opportunity for um, transformation in healthcare and cancer care specifically is massive. And I think the only sort of piece I would add is that the, the, the solutions need to be well, mind, like well guarded. We have to be specific about what we're doing. We can't be sort of all over the place. That's sort of the, they have to be, they have to really sort of be focused on what our endpoint is and make sure that it's not sort of all over the place. Um, that's sort of the, the basics for me. I don't, I, I see the massive opportunity there. I mean, there's just, we, I mean, it's, it's really, I think we were uh, moved to earlier, we're like, we, if we've been talking about it for eight years here or seven years here, it has been out there with radiology and everything. We are doing a lot of stuff with it in the healthcare space already. So it's just taking it to the next level. Exactly. So, I mean, Taha of GE and uh, Peter Schart of Siemens said I mean, radiology, for instance, much clearer images can AI is able to do. On top of that, they can find things which even a doctor might miss. Uh, they can tell the doctor and, and therapist precisely where in an organ you need to target and leave out healthy tissues. There are all areas which uh, they felt AI is already beginning to kind of help. I would agree. So in radiology specifically, what, what, it, what it has the ability to do with a, a very high percentage of success, like in the 98 to 99%, is eliminate those cases that are not bad. And they can say, there's nothing sorry to worry about in this particular scan or this image. What it then eliminates for the, for the doctor or the clinician is don't focus on that massive number of images, just focus on these 10. And to your point, only focus in these particular areas. Or I don't have enough information. Can you go in and get another scan of that so that I can see the specific area? So yes, I would agree. And those are only going to get better. OK. Sangeeta, in India, I mean, industries uh, which where, where do you think, which industries, which segments do you think AI hiring is going to become big, important? I think it will impact all sectors, but, but I think all the research that is currently out there points to four key sectors. One is obviously banking and financial services and what can happen with AI implementation, which is already happening in, in many ways. Uh, the second is really, really the retail and CPG sector because there's just so much customer centricity that AI can provide there. Um, I think if you think about healthcare, again, uh, Christopher already talked about that, but, but you're seeing very innovative examples, whether it's drug discovery or diagnostic. I think there's a lot of very interesting things happening. And I think the last is really manufacturing right? that, uh, that can really transform itself with use of AI. So those are the four sectors where the most change is likely, where you're seeing early adoption of use cases, particularly from a Gen AI perspective. AI has been around for a much, much longer time, but you're really seeing even in Gen AI that's happening. And from a business function, it's really customer service, sales and marketing, uh, product research and design, and software coding. Any particular example you think which kind of amazed you? Anything yet? Um, I, I think there are lots of examples, but, but clearly I think if you read about uh, how L'Oreal, which is a beauty fashion company, right? And you would say, why do they need to invest in AI? But they are making a significant investment in AI. They have a center in India also. They're working with a number of partners. But they're really saying, how do I leverage AI to track and listen to all the product customers are looking for, and then embed those features into the products that L'Oreal will, uh, will build out. I, I think if you talk about Merck, they're talking about how they can accelerate drug discovery using uh, generative AI. 
Uh, I think if you look at some of the music stuff that's happening, video generation that uh, OpenAI started with Sora recently, the art of the possible is very high. But, but I think I just want to say that most of the research is still saying that AI is not smarter than humans. Uh, so, so there's still scope for humans to be there, particularly around areas of complex reasoning, mathematical models, the ability to really collaborate and, and figure out how things work. So AI is, AI is a tool as an agent. It's a supportive augmentation tool. It's, it's not something that's replacing humans. So. Okay, that kind of reminded me of that... Uh tweet, I think it was by one American author, I think, um, went viral all over the world, which kind of said, uh, well, I wish, uh, I mean, the lady who said, I, I wish <laughs> AI would take care of my laundry and uh, dishes rather than take away the ability to write and uh, do my art, uh, which is what things like ChatGPT are in increasingly allowing you to do. Basically, it kind of saying, uh, something that I enjoy doing, please, let not AI do that. Let, uh, can AI focus on something else? Raj, I wanted to bring you in there uh, in terms of what is it that you think humans will still do better than AI? Where will the human effort still become really, really important? Where should professionals who are here with us, what should they focus on? Yeah, no, I think it's... Um, I think there's uh, 10 years ago... World Economic Forum, you know, had um, the top 10 trends 10 years ago. And one of them was uh, quantified human being, right? So everything that I do, if you can quantify it, meaning make it digital, you know, capture it, right? So you, all the clicks that you do, you know, all the sensors that we have in our lives and stuff like that, that obviously, I think, you know, can be understood by AI, can be predicted, you know, and you can sort of, you know, do all the modeling and all that, right? But about 99% of what we do actually is not captured. Not? Is not captured by any technology, by any sensor, right, et cetera. So the human emotion, ingenuity, I think, practical in everything that you could be, you may be flipping a burger, but you know, that burger, how it actually needs to be at what temperature, you know, that day, um, you know, and you know, how do you sort of you know, serve that particular customer? I think actually can mean a lot, you know, in my opinion, right? You know, uh, and so therefore, I think to, to sort of say that the, the robotics and the AI actually takes everything away, I don't think so. However, the predictable, whatever, you know, you can actually sort of have mathematically and all that, I think, of course, you know, you know we can do all of that, right? But I believe that um, many, actually practically in Brilio, for example, every single job that we have, right, um, I think, requires for us to have that customer emotion, requires for us to understand their business. And I don't think that actually can be done by AI at all. It's just not possible, right? You know, like 10 different ways of collaboration and driving, it's not gonna happen. So I don't see, so I would say that, you know, our, our folks actually have to learn to use the AI tools, but then really get world-class, you know, in serving our customers, understanding them and impacting them. So softer skills, how do you infuse in the, yeah, yeah, so I think we have a, you know, we, we have a, a very defined program, different tracks. So, you know, inside the company, uh, for every level, for every job, I think we actually have defined software and, you know, and the core functional skills. So, and that training is available to our worldwide employees, you know, uh, and, you know, at their disposal uh, real time. So that's how we're sort of doing it. And, you know, we are also making it up to them to sort of, you know, learn and sort of, you know, top-down stuff, right? So I think it sort of, you know, has you need better output for us. Okay, softer skills, important. Uh, Chris, uh, how will the role of a CTO or a CDO now change in the times of AI, in terms of planning, staffing, and handling issues? What are you doing in 2024 that you were not doing 10 years ago? That's a three-part question. So I would say our, our roles as a CTO or a CDO has already changed. If you just think back, let's say five years ago, my job fundamentally would be to put a three to five year strategic plan together. Here's my roadmap. Here are all the sort of tools and things I need to actually accomplish that. If I did that today, it's basically invalid in 12 months, right? So I can't really do that anymore. So how do we solve the problem? I think as we talked a little bit about earlier, the 
types of people that I would need to actually do that is our technologists who understand the business, who have a tremendous set of functional skills, and who are very data driven, right? And if you can piece all that together with people who understand the business, you can put groups together to understand the business goals in a much deeper level than we do today, right? I think we all today cursory understand how the business operates. I think we do have to understand that at a deeper level so that when we get into solutioning and we get into sort of adding value, we can do it much more, much more precisely and much more quickly than we do today. How that relates to staffing is, I think the term is, is known, which is you're looking for more purple unicorns, right? Everybody wants a purple unicorn. And if you are a purple unicorn, if you want to be a purple unicorn, those are sort of the base skills that I think you need. And the more of those there are, the more, that's what I'm going to be looking for from a staffing and hiring perspective. Um, and then what am I doing today uh, differently than I was doing a few years ago? You know, Raj sort of stole the, th the thunder. But it really, as his role as the CEO, he cares about culture, right? He needs an entire company to move in one direction, to think as one and act as one. As a chief digital officer, that was never sort of my job. I didn't need to create sort of a subculture or a way that I needed a team to behave and, and act. I do today, right? I care about communication. I care about culture. I care about how we put these people and teams together to be as effective as possible. And that's not something I worried about five years ago. OK. Things are moving much faster. Yeah. Sangeeta, uh, at the policy making level, is India really trying to understand what all this means and um, taking decisions accordingly? Plus, I also wanted you uh, for skilling. Everybody talks skilling. What exactly is India? I know you have your future skills program, um, and you have an excellent platform where you offer a lot of courses and all that. But generally speaking, what kind of skilling initiatives, and is that moving fast enough? So I think the, f the first thing is the government, many of you may have read in the media, has announced a national AI mission. So I think for the first time from a technology perspective, you're seeing all levels of the government very committed to say, how do you make AI more real for India? And of course, their vision is that AI should be able to reach the last mile in India. So AI in India is not just for uh, people who can afford to pay for it, but AI in India is for everybody, uh, every Indian, uh, as they'd like to think about it. And they've built out a very interesting framework on how they will do it, everything from access to compute, because to build out AI models, you will need subsidized compute, because compute is the most expensive thing on Earth right now. I think Sam Altman said it's the new electricity. So, so I think clearly compute is a big cost, and the government is providing for that. They're investing in building out foundational models, because a lot of the AI models that exist do not have the Indian context to it. They, do, they are not multilingual to understand Indian culture, Indian diversity. So there is investment in Indian models that's going to happen. I think a few projects are already underway with IIT and others, and I think we will see more rollout there happening. Skilling is a big focus, so they already had a number of skilling initiatives. You talked about the Future Skills Prime initiative, but clearly everybody understands that India's biggest, biggest strength is its talent base, right? And our demographics is what uh, is really going to take us forward to our vision of becoming a developed nation. And hence, AI is not just for being the AI engineer. AI is today a tool for augmenting every white collar job, right? I can be working in this hotel as a receptionist, but how will AI help me serve my customer better? How, just like we drove digital literacy, how will we drive AI literacy in this country? So, so there's a significant focus, and I think you must be tracking it, how many AI courses in 
institutions across India that have come up. I think every university has started an AI course to the extent I was in a meeting with the government and they were like, nobody's going into core engineering disciplines. We need more people to do mechanical, civil engineers. We don't want just IT, computer, and AI engineers for India. But that's on the side note. So there is significant investment in AI skilling that's happening. And then there's, of course, focus on building out a startup ecosystem. How do you build out whatever you do in a responsible and safe manner? Because AI is a great tool, but it also has a lot of concerns and risks around it. So a lot of focus on when you will build AI in India, you will do it with trust, you will do it responsibly, and have the right regulatory framework to support that. A lot of investment happening. Great to hear that. Uh, and as Sangeeta said, I mean, talent is really India's strength. And um, wh while we have that really large numbers of talent, and you know, as part of my job, I meet a lot of people like Raj and uh, Chris who keep visiting India. And invariably, they have such wonderful words to talk about India's talent. Uh, I mean, quality-wise, of course, we are right, really up there. But I mean, more than that, they just, they're just fascinated by the sheer enthusiasm, the energy, and the attitude that India's, uh, I mean, I think it's because, partly because we are much younger, uh, not me, I mean, uh, or m many of you, I guess the average age is uh, in the 20s or early 30s, I guess it's still, average age is still in the late 20s, right? Uh, I think that brings a lot of energy and enthusiasm which they don't see in most other countries. And uh, I, I love hearing when they, uh, that when they say that. Raj, final question to you, Brilio. Uh, I have some audience questions, but before that one, uh, Brilio specifically, what does AI mean for Brilio? What, what kind of disruptions do you anticipate? That, is AI bringing more work to you? Or are there challenges? Tons of work. <laughs> you should buy Brilio's talk. Um, but, uh, but no, I think um, our view on AI is enterprise-wide. Right? I don't believe it is just a model or you know, data sort of opportunity for Brilio. I think um, um, my belief is that when I look at the next decade you know, on AI particularly, I think it's across the board, right? So, uh, so, when I, you know, so we are driven by our customers and where the technology is going. So I do feel that given the amount of compute and storage required, given the investments required, the, you know, the rich gets richer in AI, right? Meaning Google and Microsoft you know, and, and AWS, I think, have the advantage that others actually would have, you know, will take you know, years or, you know, or trillions of dollars to sort of invest sometimes, in my opinion, right? So we, have, we follow that track one. So big ones and then the small ones. And then we look at our customers and say, well, how are they going to actually get better? And so combine both of those. And so we launched our Cloud and AI Studio. And our Cloud and AI Studio is actually, our view is that it's an enterprise-wide opportunity for us. So for me, um, like I said you know, in, my, in, in my opening remarks, it's, it feels like 10 years ago, right? And, uh, and the opportunity is massive. But like, you know, like I also said, it's not going to come to us by just sitting around. I think we'll, we'll need to retool, reskill ourselves for that, and we're doing it. So I've got some f four questions from employees and associates here. Uh, this one is from Ananda Kumar HR, uh, and this is for Chris and Sangeeta. Uh, so Ananda says, experts generally say that 65% of software application development will occur using AI by 2030. What message does this convey for the education industry? Should their focus be on producing more engineers, more doctors, or more techno physicians? I, you know, it's 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 hard to say just focus on one thing as a skill or a or what you want to do in school, because again, well, what we've seen is the pace of change is change is so rapid that if you are drawn to engineering, then be the best engineer that you can be. If you are drawn to being a scrum master or somebody who is a, an agile coach, have that be your thing, but be fantastic at it. Because there's, work is sort of a it's, a, it's a longitudinal thing, right? And you're gonna need different skills at different points in time. So the better you are at that, I think the more that's going to be. But I think from a, it, it, like that's where, I'm sort of aligned with Raj 100%, which is I do think it's very similar to 10 years ago where 
digital was everything, right? Digital was on everybody's banner. You go to an exhibit hall, everything was digital. And now every, it's the same companies, but now they all have AI plastered across the top. And are they doing things differently? Yes. Are they doing it like transformatively differently? No. Um, but I do, th you know, I think the, the bigger companies are producing tools at a very rapid rate. I think we are catching up to say, how do I want to apply that in my business? And that's where I need the talent from Brilio is to say, here's your problem as I've understood it. Here's how we think we can help you apply it to get to where we need to. And yeah, do I think 65% of software will be, have AI in it? It's probably a much closer number to that now, actually. Sangeeta? So, so I think if I was to add to that first, I think the 65% number is debatable, right? Every report you read has a different number. And when you talk to people in real life use cases, I think the evidence is different because it's very contextual to a client. What are their processes? It's a regulated sector. It's a not regulated sector. So I think there is a vast array of data and numbers that you will see over the next few years as, as AI moves to production. Today, it's more at still somewhat at a POC stage with some uh, something getting more productionized, uh, some, some, uh, some applications moving. But I think the important question there is really, which was valid as, as both uh, Raj and Christopher said, even in the digital era, that you, don't, you have to have context. So interdisciplinary education is super critical. It's not just about uh, being a software engineer. So if you want to work in healthcare, knowledge of healthcare is important. If you want to work in insurance, knowledge of insurance is important. If you want to build AI applications, you will need a diverse team to build that. You cannot just have engineers. You will need sociologists. You will need very different set of people than what you've done. So you don't only need to have everyone doing engineering in this country. You can be a non-engineer, you can be a bachelor in five, you do a degree in bachelor in fine arts and still contribute to be a great AI developer, right? So, so I think the fee, AI is democratizing education also. So it's an opportunity for our education system to take that really. This is for Raj. Uh, with so many advancements and increased capabilities in AI, do you think it is better if companies invest in getting licenses for GPT-4, GitHub Copilot, Gemini 1.5 Pro for each of their employees, as it will improve productivity, reduce dependencies, and contribute to the overall company's health? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. I invested in, uh, in Chat GPT license, and I think I'm writing better emails now. Um, but... Uh, but I think that said, I, no, I don't believe that all of our employees need uh, access to these tools. However, I do feel that Brilio should invest you know, in what matters most for different roles and how we serve our customers better, one. Second, I think we also have to be extremely careful that we serve our customers and their privacy, their data is extremely important, right? So, you know, proliferation of, you know, of these tools sometimes can you know, cause a significant amount of challenge you know, into, and compromise that promise that we have to our customers. So therefore, I'm a, a big proponent of you know, saying no to that. Unless we can figure out you know, what the tool really does and how do we secure our customers' data. I think and then you know, we, we should, you know, of course, you know, include that. Okay, Nikhil, sure, you're not getting it immediately. It'll take some time. Mm. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, okay, it's time. So, in 15 seconds each, can you tell our youngsters here what to focus on? Uh, who wants to start? Sangeeta, go ahead. Okay. Um, like I said, I think you know it better, but, but focus on what matters the most to you, right? Your learning, uh, and learning is now going to be a continuous learning process. So I would just say invest in continuous learning and, and do it for whatever excites you. Chris. In 15 seconds, I'll go back to the banner. The AI revolution and the future of tech jobs is very good. Right? We may be in a small dip, but I do not see that slowing down whatsoever. So... Uh, I would say that you know, cloud took about 20 years to get about 60% penetration. AI will take half of that. That's how rapidly it's actually going to hit us. 
So don't be a naysayer. Embrace it, right? And work with, you know, with, like, for example, you know, for all of this team, I would say work with, you know, uh, with Brilio and teams to sort of, you know, make sure that you are fully prepared. Embrace it, embrace it, embrace it. Don't fight it. It's here to help. There you go. Embrace AI. That's the message. Uh, thank you all so much for a delightful discussion. Thank, thank you. you.